Um, welcome to everyone, and uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, my name is Simon Williams. I'm a GP in the um, Surrey Downs area. Um, I'm also, for a title, the Clinical Director for Urgent Care and Integration at Surrey Downs CCG, and I'm also the Clinical Lead for End of Life Care at Surrey Downs CCG. And this afternoon's um, sort of events really um, are a focus around um, carers. Um, and I can't um, impress more upon those of you who are carers, perhaps, in the audience, you know, what an important role you have to play um, in actually caring for individuals in the sort of last, um, last period of, of their lives. And really has how we as organisations, and there are many, many organisations, um, providers, uh, commissioners represented here this afternoon, as, as to what role we can play to support you in caring for um, your loved ones in, in, in a way that actually we can bring about um, improvements to that, as I say, that um, last period of, of an individual's life. So what's, what's extremely important is to get audience participation. Um, we can all sort of just sit and listen, but actually I'm, I'm a great one for advocating a lot of noise. Um, encouragement, um, perhaps not too much booing or shouting, um, but, but actually anything that you can possibly um, say, you know, it is, is a great, um, you know, contribution to um, any of the events, um, you know, which are taking place this afternoon. So without any further um, delay, I'd like to introduce um, Leslie Good Goodburn, um, who I'm going to let represent herself and explain exactly what she is and what she does. So, Leslie, thank you. So, my name is Leslie Goodburn. I'm going to talk to you today about love, relationships, empathy, compassion, and something called <coughs> over refinement. So I want you to imagine it's 2014, it's spring, it's bright, it's sunny, and you're looking forward to the rest of the year. You're in a loving relationship with your husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever it may be. And you've got two significant birthdays coming up this year, you're both going to be 50. And as well as that, it's going to be your 10th wedding anniversary. So you've got everything to look forward to, life's great. And to celebrate those events, you've just booked the trip of a lifetime to go to China, Hong Kong and Singapore. So life's good. You've got everything to look forward to in the future. But then after one of you feeling unwell for a little while, going to and fro to the GPs and the out-of-hours doctors, um, one night after work, I went for an emergency appointment with the GP, and sent to the a and &E department, admitted overnight. The next day they do a CAT scan, and unfortunately, you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer that is quite late stage, that has spread, and at that point in time, you're told you've got days, maybe weeks to live. And as you might imagine, at that point in time, the world turns very dark. And that's what happened to my husband, Seth. Um, Seth and I were married 10 years before. We've been together for 16 years. Life was great. Seth didn't feel particularly unwell until two weeks before his diagnosis. And we were suddenly given the news that Seth was dying. So we felt like we could, the world was our oyster. And we had everything to live for, and then suddenly the world shrunk back, and we started to have pretty quick discussions about home being really the important place for Seth, the place that he wanted to die. But the progression of the disease and the responsiveness of the system meant that Seth was quite quickly admitted to a hospital, and unfortunately, um, 33 days after his diagnosis, he died 
in an acute hospital, despite wanting to die at home. And that was partly because the disease was so rampant, but partly because actually the focus was on the medical side of things, the clinical side of things, the symptom management, rather than the holistic care, the understanding of what somebody who is dying wants to achieve. Even though someone is dying, they still have goals and aspirations, they still have things they want to achieve. But actually the conversations that we had were all about the symptoms. They weren't about Seth and what Seth wanted. And when we did talk about that, the system didn't really listen and respond. So, you may have read a book called Be More Quite Told the Wendy, I don't know whether you have or not. If you haven't, it's worth a read. If you have, you're probably really familiar with some of the things in there. But really, three things, if someone had asked us three things at the point Seth was diagnosed, the three things were what makes life worthwhile, what scares you, and what would you trade to achieve what makes life worthwhile. If somebody somewhere in the system had asked us those questions, or actively listened, and responded with compassion, then maybe Seth wouldn't have died in an acute hospital. Maybe Seth would have died at home. So when Seth died, my world turned quite black. Didn't quite know what to do. It was 33 days from the point of diagnosis to the point that Seth died. He was here one minute and he was literally gone in the blink of an eye. So six months after um, Seth died, I got the records from the hospital and I sat down to kind of write down what happened during those 33 days to kind of chronicle what, what was the kind of chronology of what happened. And as I did that, I shut myself in a room for a week and cried an awful lot. Um, I found myself writing letters to clinicians, to oncologists, to physiotherapists, to pharmacists, that explained what it felt like to be me or Seth on each of those days. <coughs> Some of those letters were really very positive about when people did listen and respond to it, how they made us feel like we were valued and worthwhile. But quite a few of those letters were around kind of how the system overshadowed the person and the person-centred care. Um, so six months after Seth died, wrote those letters in the chronology, <coughs> went to the CCG and spoke to the director of um, quality, who was going to do lots of things to make sure that we could learn from, from that experience. Also spoke to the local hospital and director of nursing. We were going to do lots of things to do work, be reg nurses, do training courses. But six months after those two different meetings, which weren't together, my idea was that the commission of providing care, we would all sit down together and talk about what the learning was. Six months after, eight months afterwards, no one came back to me and nothing had changed. And at that point in time, again, it felt like the world was very black because I'd kind of chronicled what happened and I wanted to share it. I wanted to share it to improve, not to criticise. I wanted to try and make sure that our experience wasn't repeated <coughs> by other people. Um, but that didn't quite work. So in the meantime, through a partnership that initially started with the National Council for Palliative Care, which then emerged with Hospice UK and became Hospice UK, um, we took the letters that were written and we decided to develop a play called Home of Bound. It was a joint exercise between St Giles Hospice up in um, Staffordshire, NHS England, Hospice UK, Pancreatic Cancer UK, Leeds Teaching Hospital, myself and the playwright Brian Daniels, and we produced a play called Home of Bound, and that was launched in March 2016. In March 2017, we actually developed a film of the play so that more people could see the film and more people could kind of learn from that film. So today, we're going to watch Home of Bound film, <coughs> and then I'm going to capture some thoughts about, from a systems perspective, perhaps what could, have, what could have been done differently. So I just wanted to, <coughs> to open it up to any thoughts, any, 
I didn't want to show anything else you say. See why you don't have to wait. So that's the second time I've watched that. And I have to say, I'm equally moved the second time I've seen it. I mean, there's lessons there for everybody. I think in whatever you do, I don't know to say that it's about something we think is really about the impact of actions that we do on other people. There's such simple things that people are turning to that because it's made your autumn set journey more comfortable. I mean, the end of the end journey yeah, could change that, but you could things could change when you do. And, and I, I really, I hope certainly that I will take that away. I hope that people in my organisation will be reflecting on that. A little bit of feedback from people who watched the final film. I've asked them thinking about difficult conversations to brave or courageous conversations. I think if Seth and I have had um, different conversations, more honest and open conversations, and people have listened and responded. Of the things made by other people that come for us. Um, this one was from a medical student. I believe the play and subsequent discussion has been the single most useful teaching experience I've had this year and will ultimately make me a better doctor. So, up until now, how we found the play, the film, and the educational resource because you can also download. The educational resource <coughs> has mostly been used at kind of end of life conferences and group of conferences, educational sessions at hospices and within the hospitals. Um, but talking to Debbie, we really wanted to use Home and Found in Surrey with the work we've been doing around integration and all the parents' work to really think about not just kind of the small changes that people can make in practice, but also think about the system level changes thinking about the head, the heart and the hands and how all that may come together to kind of change the experiences of carers around end of life. So we were hoping that from, from the, the kind of session today that we could think about home we found in terms of the head, the heart and the hands and the, the work that we've been doing and think about through the sessions later today and going forward how that might kind of transform the system in terms of better end of life care. In the film it talked about the poor ex capita, which would have got set home and allowed the fluid to be draining from his abdomen at home. Nobody offered that. I asked for it. It took me five days of arguing about nice guidelines and high volume paracentesis and eventually somebody listened and said yes, the poor ex capita was an option. They then came back and said community nurses were trained to administer a poor ex capita in the community. I asked them to train me, but by then Seth had deteriorated so much and I was so worn out with arguing with a system who really weren't listening to me, weren't responding to me. But by the time we got to the point where we could get a poor ex capita and like somebody could show me how to do it, I was so stressed out, the stuff was so poorly that I decided actually that my time was so short with Seth that I wanted to spend it with him, not knowing how to administer a capita. But actually, if that capita had been there at the start of those five days of arguing, the training had been done, maybe Seth could have died at home. Because quite often people say, when they watch the film, they say, well, that would never have happened because we've got loads of community nurses trained. But if the hospital isn't offering that as an option to get someone home, it doesn't matter how many community nurses you've got trained. In terms of the palliative care team, it took 14 days from the point of sex diagnosis for the first contact with any professional about the choices we might make. But we've been told Seth have got days when he needs to live. So thinking about the system, thinking about the head, heart and the hands, how can we in the Surrey Park kind of bring that all together, building on the work that we've already done in terms of integration and using home and bound as a kind of catalyst to have some of those discussions? And home and bound is Seth's legacy. Thanks for listening.